is that to always have a great dinner every night. <laughs> it works for me. So uh, I want to thank you for coming. And also, we didn't thank the speakers. And I think like uh, Uber ratings, so we don't lower the five-star rating. Could we have a, a round of applause for speaker before I speak? So I guess you say, uh, je suis désolé uh, de ne pas pouvoir donner cette conférence en, en français. <laughs> and if you can understand that, you know why I'm not speaking French. <laughs> the, uh, it, it's really great. And I'm going to do a kind of American thing. So all the Europeans and most of the Canadians will be furious. Um, I'd like to ask everybody who is a type designer to stand up. Yeah. yeah. All right. Everybody who is, helps them, who's supporting, working in the foundries or the type business in one way or another, stand up. Everyone stay standing up. All right. Everybody who's a typographer, graphic designer, uses, who's customers, who uses type, stand up. That's me. Stand up. Any educators or teachers of type, stand up. All right, the only people who are left are the hated media. <laughs> All right, now, quick, before you sit down, group hug. Everyone turn around, say, say hello to everybody. Think of it like church. We don't get this much. How many times do you see type designers? This many. It's... <laughs> It's fantastic. <laughs> wow. All right, there we go. So I did I couldn't stop myself from doing it. I did that for a reason. My talk is about the type boom. And what the hell? How how do we how do we feel that it's a boom? How do I think it's a boom? And I think that just proves it. How could there be this many of us? Coming to Montreal, I mean, I think the dumb people have left, so it's only the smart ones of us who've, who've stayed oh, on. <laughs> or or, the, or they're certain of my enemies. But the, uh, the, who are all of us? And how, how can we do this right after so many went to TypeCon? I've seen at least 50 people I saw in Boston. Um, and then there was kerning and typographics, and there's going to be bits and typographia. It's astounding. Um, we, I remember, we're talking about the, the, the long-serving, long-suffering board members and presidents of this organization. I remember coming when Eric Speakerman described it as a, uh, a German type founders club. And there were about 50 to 80 people who would show up. We would have some good meals, an after-dinner speaker. Uh, the designers would be showing their portfolios in the parking lots to, to the founders and the uh, manufacturers who came. And that was it. Uh, it was a very small group of people. And, and most of the type designers had full-time jobs. Most uh, for big companies who made machines, where the machine people didn't think that much about them. They just knew they needed that stuff to sell more machines. And the, uh, the people who were, were interested in type didn't really have much contact with type designers. It was, it was more like people like me who were just pushy and, and aggressive who would like call up Mike Parker and go over to the 34th Street letter drawing office in 19, I'm going to say 76, 77, and found David Burlow working away on the Rubilith. Uh, but not most, most designers did not in, have contact with, with type people and vice versa. Uh, it was an entirely different world. And that, that boom uh, started, started with uh, the end of the machine era and, it, and continues in the last few years, it, there's exponential growth. So what is it? What's going on here? How can all these graduates of all these type schools get work? Um, several of them have pointed out to me that they didn't. And, <laughs> and I should be careful with that, that generalization. But, uh, there's an article in Type Magazine about uh, four of them that, that Stu wrote that really kind of 
is extremely uh, uplifting. There are just four, four examples of, of, of Redding and Cooper and KBK. And what's that place in France? And <laughs> yes, and it's, uh, it's a, uh, and there are many more that uh, several people wrote in and say, okay, hey, you're, you're leaving us out of here. What is it? Uh, three of the four are essentially full time type designers, and the other wants to do graphic design too uh, for his own reasons. And why, how can that happen? How can, so and who are all these people? Okay, remember how hard it was to get web fonts to start? It, was, it took like, despite Microsoft's efforts in 1997, which we all refused to go along with, the EOT era. We, um, we, we, it took us 15 years to get web fonts, and now every website seems, every big website anyway has, has a web font. Doesn't every company have a typeface? It's, it's unbelievable. They all have chosen a typeface. Some of them hired, hired uh, type designers to do a custom typeface or customize one. So I've heard it at these conferences the phrase, the type industry. Well, I think that may be the wrong era for that word. I, I mean, indus literally, industry is okay for this. But uh, I like to call it the type business. And so anyone, anytime you start talking about the type business, the word monotype comes up. Uh, and that's in part, it's the only public company where we can get the numbers. So it's also the biggest. So let's take a look at monotype. Uh, how big is the type business? Well. Monotype's market cap is 788 million. That's, that's, that's real money. Um, as, now that's less than it once was, but it's still quite a lot of money. The July quarter, uh, second quarter report showed 57.8 million in sales, which is 19% more than last year. The 2016 annual report showed 203 a uh, million in revenue, which is 6% up. So if they keep up that 19%, uh, they're gonna have 240 this year, including creative professional, that is to say, um, the people who, the, the, their market that they call creative professional, there's half of that is going to them, which is also an increase, which means they're either selling a lot more of those fonts or they're selling less OEM fonts. So how many type designers? You know, it's hard to get the historical numbers, but what uh, Matthew Carter could tell us, how many type designers were there in 1970? There were a, a couple of hundred, maybe, uh, all, you know, even all over the world, maybe more in Asia. So I asked some of my friends, just by a very, very uh, non-scientific questionnaire, what do you think? And I heard uh, that there's... Over a thousand, very low four digits was one response. 700 in the West, 800 in Asia. That's, you know, 1,500. 1,000, somebody says. Thir one expert in New York said 30 in New York City, <laughs> which <laughs> may be the only thing that matters. So 30, in, somebody in, 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 uh, South, in uh, South Asia said 30 in India in countries with index scripts. So uh, that's a lot. How many people are graduating? with degrees or some kind of certificate in type, type design. And uh, the numbers there vary too. 300, some, someone said as low as 80, I think it's, it's more. But 300, how do, how do we absorb 300 new type designers every year in the industry? Well, one thing is that we're using type like, there's, like we've never seen before. And here's a, my favorite statistic about end users. Number of times Google Fonts API served Open Sans over last week, 26.4 in a tiny B. <laughs> it's like a billion. <laughs> so on 20 million websites, that is an astonishing number. I mean, we're happy at Font Bureau. It's like, you know, we got 10,000 sites. <laughs> you know, yippee. <laughs> And, and they're, they're, they're 2,000 times our rate or 10,000 times. And how many end users? This is the real story. Uh, and when we get to the whys of this, it will make more sense, but there are over 6 billion people who know how to read in the world. 
And if we move out of our immediate sphere of market and think about them, that's what, that is the real driving force. Uh, and we now have ways to reach all of them fairly quickly. It's pretty amazing. Okay, so what is the boom? What, what really caused the boom? We, we, see, we think that there's a boom. The, just the buoyancy of, of our business, the fact that we're all working, that we can afford to come to Montreal. We have been eating like kings. Uh, what's wrong with it? You know, what, what, what could be wrong with this? Well, and what, and what causes it? How can we pay for it? So I use the all one metaphor, which Nick Sherman gave to me. Uh, almost all lettering today is made with one file format, open type. Uh, so the text displays in your car, on your TV, on the sides of trucks, on the tops of buildings, on billboards, thermostats, highway signs, wristwatches, baseball hats, those little stickers that are on your oranges and apples. They have type that comes from open type fonts. It's like, man, it's everywhere. It used to be that we would have hand-drawn signs or hand-painted signs. And fortunately, there are quite a few people still know how to do that and are doing beautiful work. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about type. But look at this. I mean, I don't know if I would ever go on this airplane. Uh, but it's, this is not hand lettering. Maybe there was a little kerning, little overlapping done in the logo type. But everything else is, is just vinyl letters from a PC. So all one, everything is made from the same format. And then I have four more. I added one in honor of our teachers who are in the audience. What I call brand, globe, skill, and code. So, brand. Nowadays, it's essential to use type to help create, market, and maintain your brand. And the amount of, the number of companies, enterprises, small restaurants, everybody who understands this idea that the typeface that we use reflects our voice, our personality, the, our attitude toward our customers. Uh, it reflects us. And so we want a consistent use of type. Wouldn't necessarily have to be one typeface, but everybody seems to be uh, devolving to a brand type for their, for their operation. The smarter ones understand that the UI, uh, the drop-down menus on their app, on their website, also are their brand. And they need help on that. Your type is your voice, it's your brand. Um, so I think that has an enormous power for us as, as type designers. Here's, here's one example, I think I, may I skip one? Yeah, Citibank. I of course like this because it's based on interstate. Your first speaker, Paula, is responsible for this, this original design. This, this book, uh, this style book, was done by Malcontent, another design firm. Uh, funny name, uh, but it, 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 you can find this online. It's a, a very cool looking book, and it's just showing off this is the, their typeface. Um, another Font Bureau customer is Ford, and they chose Antenna. We've done a lot of customization and, and localization for them with that. They had this funny slogan, I shouldn't say anything negative, go further. Okay, shouldn't it be go further? Anyway. Um, Globe, uh, global companies need global brands. I mean, need global fonts. And that is also giving us a big, a big boost. It's, it's kind of those of us who are these single language speakers who kind of you know, move our lips when we read Spanish. And uh, we can kind of get through the airports and hotels in the Latin countries and kind of fake it in Germany, uh, but are completely lost in mo most of the world, in, in Asia. Uh, and most of us are like that. Most of us have one or two languages, three languages, if you're, if you're really good, except for the damn Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Swiss do pretty well. Uh, but the Dutch seem to speak everything. I, I, uh, I think that anyone who's a type designer has to start understanding this. And we had a wonderful lecture this morning about how you pair um, Japanese and Latin. It's pretty tricky. And it certainly helps to know both languages before you do that, but you could get two people together to work it out, I think, which is what we're trying to do in the languages that we don't know. But 
you know, it, that, that work in the globe, like what, just to look at Ford, okay, so we got a little A ring, <laughs> uh, so that we can uh, set Swedish. But then there's Cyrillic and Greek antenna for those markets. And then you, then you get into the issues, okay, how do we pair Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and then what about all those Indic, uh, I, I was gonna put in here, I forgot, the, on, the, uh, on the rupee note, there's a little list, a little translation uh, list of the, the, of the note and denomination. It says 100 rupees in 15 languages, uh, many with different scripts, uh, in, that are the official languages or the, most, the, the biggest of the official languages in India. And uh, so you get into this thing where then there's Arabic and Hebrew. We, we all are kind of getting aware of this. Look at the, the, the conference program we just had. There was a, a nod to each of those languages and scripts. And the feeling, I mean, 10 years ago at A-Type I, when the Chinese came on, you know, we would all go just have our naps. We, it, what does it have to do with me? I don't, I don't you know, Fiona paid to, total attention or, the, the folks from Reading, but uh, I don't think that the mo most of us really paid much attention. Now we must. We ha I mean, the reason I, I moved to Hong Kong for three years was just so it rubbed in my face. I could, I could stay in a place that the English worked, but I could get quickly into the mainland or go to Vietnam or go to, to Thailand or Taiwan and see what's going on. And I think that we all have that curiosity. We all, we all want to be able to use multiple language uh, uh, versions of our fonts, or work with other fonts that, that, that can be paired intelligently, so they can read them, so they're not corrupted. I, I don't want to mention any type foundries by name, but uh, we don't want to put out a global font where they're all trying to look like, say, antenna, and stylistically, because you might not be able to read it in Korean if it had those square, everything was squared off that way. We, that would sort of come first for me. So uh, I think that that kind of sensibility is very important, but at the same time, it's driving business in an astonishing way. And we are in touch, and the, and the schools are, are, are training in a, a, wide, uh, a wide variety of languages that we never thought of. And that school thing becomes more and more important. Um, I went to the lunch, that the, the educator lunch yesterday, and I, was, I felt completely out of place. It's like going to a college reunion when I didn't graduate. Um, I, go, I went, <laughs> I have friends from college. They gave me an award. <laughs> I think they were looking for a donation. But the, the thing is that, uh, I, I, excuse me, I never looked at uh, somebody's academic credentials when hiring them in my studio or the Font Bureau. Uh, maybe I should have. Uh, what I was looking for at was their work. And I've always felt it was hard to teach design. But then again, I'm an American and I think that it's hard to teach foreign languages and all of my German friends learned their English in school. It's like, okay, you can, you can teach it, but we can't. And I think that's true with design. I think design can be taught and I think what's coming out of Reading or KAVK or Type Media or, the, um, or, uh, type, uh, or type of Cooper and, and the rest is, I mean, they're amazing, they're amazing fonts that we're seeing immediately. Uh, and they're not all kids. These are people who decided to go back to school. So, but these recent graduates are doing astounding work, and I urge you to read the, 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 lead, the, the lead article and type for those uh, four examples of that. It, it's an amazing, amazing uh, accomplishment for education to work this well. Um, and we, I, we, this boom could not be sustained. We could not address the market without these, this new blood and this new knowledge. Uh, and then the, the last segment of this, uh, there's KVK, and then is code. So this, of course, leaves me pretty much out of it. I am, I'm back at some kind of HTML 1.0 level of <laughs> you know, front-end coding. Um, and the, I understand you know, what an algorithm is. I'll go that far. But, uh, and I understand the principle of this. And of course, you know, going back to the history of A-Type I, when here at Northside would come and talk to us uh, 20 years ago, 30, 30 years ago, 
we would sit in the back and say, he's out of his mind. What is he talking about? This doesn't make any sense. And everything he said came true. We, we are doing parametric design now. We are doing, I mean, the whole idea of responsive typography was what he was predicting uh, in, you know, coming, coming from The Hague uh, three decades ago in writing about it. And, and uh, it seemed impossible, and now it's happening. So I think that this group that's coming out of the schools has a, a uh, ambidextrous or bilingual uh, attitude about design. You know, is, we were talking about this uh, at dinner last night, is what's the difference between a designer who's really in the groove, analog, you know, drawing and sketching and, you know, doing some InDesign work or whatever, and that the love that they have what they're doing, and, and somebody who is writing, writing rules, writing, writing the, the code for a responsive website. They, get, they lose this sense of time. The work is in their mind. It's not really what they're typing away. And it's really fun. Uh, that's an amazing thing. And you see this in the work, the, the, uh, having the tools that uh, a lot of people use glyphs. We're, we use Robo. Um, being able to write extensions and do things, uh, do things for, for Robo has made our work much more powerful. We have uh, Jill Prochetta is here. The, at Type Network, uh, we're able to get the beginning of machine learning in type design. We're getting automatic feedback. We're getting uh, quality control uh, directions back from the tools. Uh, we're able to, to experiment and do things very rapidly. Uh, using these tools. I mean, I used to think only David Berlow uh, could do this. And in 1990, we did title Gothic, titling Gothic for, uh, for the LA Times. And I just wanted one wait. It's page 263 of the 1923 book in the upper right-hand corner. I just need one wait for the headers, because I don't want to use, I don't remember what the other grot was who we were using, the Gothic. but. Um, <clears throat> Like, that was Friday morning, uh, California time. Monday, I got 144 weights and wits. <laughs> this is 1990. <laughs> it's like, holy shit. And he had just hooked the GX thing up to it. And, um, and he, he had been thinking since the Icarus days about this, the, uh, the way that the axes and, uh, and the poles work together and how what those middles are going to look like in the end. It's astonishing. It's in his mind. And now the software has, has come up to that level uh, with people like Peter Van Blockland and Just uh, and Eric. There, there is amazing progress that we're, we're able to make uh, in the design of type using code. And the great thing is that you know, it's, it's not two different camps anymore. I mean, there are people like me who can't do a thing, but there are uh, they're, at least I appreciate what they're doing. That in the old days, you had the, the, the manufacturing department, the people who are making the big hardware that's going to make all the money, and the idiots in the font department who uh, you know, are just kind of making, make it, make, making little things that help sell, sell the machines. And uh, you, I would hear Mike Parker talk about that uh, in the old days. And I think that that progress of combining the whole, you know, uh, the whole production level into software has changed uh, our attitude about what design is. And it is transforming. It's making this boom possible. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. So, all right. So those are, those are the, the things that I think are the reason for the boom and how we're able to deal with it. As soon as I start talking about the boom, people say, well, does that mean there's going to be a crash? Well, yeah. Uh, the, I remember in 2008, in the real estate crash, there's a big uh, developer in the US called Toll Brothers. And the founder was asked on television, he said, Mr. Mr. Toll, is, uh, do you think that there can be a soft landing in this crash? And <laughs> he just kind of smiled and said, there is no such thing as a soft landing. And there wasn't, and I don't think um, you know, we've seen it, we've seen busts in, before. It's not all going to be easy. The, uh, the economy can grind to a halt. We could have an idiot in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever thought that would happen? Like this, uh, you know, all kinds of things can happen. Wars happen. Things happen. 
So b the boom won't last forever. Um, but another s side of that is that nothing stays the same anyway. You know, uh, we, we, had, we were in Type Magazine, we were talking about the amazing fonts of the, of the 19th century, the, the, the design development going from moderns uh, to, to slabs to sans serifs in so few years, and then outlines and roundeds and ornamented fonts, and very, very quickly, how that, uh, that was an astounding explosion driven by commercial forces, where the, there wasn't this kind of rather sine wave economic graph that we have today. It was more like constant panics. Every, you know, every, the 1920s was another wonderful period in type history. And, if you look at the economic indicators, you had about a two-year run and then it bust, and then two years and then it bust, and then two years and then it bust, and then finally it really bust. You know, if we had another Great Depression, type design designers would have to scrape for a living like everyone else. But in the meantime, what can we do? Uh, I actually believe that this boom, this type boom, is going to continue indefinitely. That we can, that there will be increasing demand for our goods and services, uh, even in bad economic times. Uh, we'll have to trim ourselves, we'll have to figure things out. Uh, we've done it before, uh, and we've made massive, you know, everyone says, okay, we figured out variations. Well, we didn't yet, but we're going to. Um, there's gonna be another big change five years from now. This, this industry is just, is not gonna just stay stable. So never mind the economy, imagine that there's gonna be change, it's like the, the uh, it, what did the Heraclitus said? The only constant is change. Or I like that quote: um, "You can never step into the same stream twice." You know, I'm still doing pretty much the same thing that I always did, but it is so different. It's very, it's sort of hard to imagine. And I think many other professions are like that. Medicine is, uh, but uh, the what's happened to us is not going to just stay this way. So let's get ready. So how do we get ready? And then. I'm going to just uh, kind of bring this to a close so that we can have a little bit of conversation. But I'm seeing that we have to get very aware of what our market is. Now, we've talked about the, what's causing the boom. We've given you some numbers. I'd like to really get some hard data. We have zero data in this business. Uh, one of the things that we might be able to do with Type Magazine is commission some syndicated research, get some help from the companies who are interested to really find out some of these numbers. What is the mark, like, what's the difference between uh, OEM and retail, and then what's the difference between um, internal type design? I mean, how much is Apple spending on fonts? Who knows? You know, and we know Microsoft, it, I mean, the fact that Kevin gave this amazing uh, speech about the work they're doing for, for kids with reading problems. Well, that's, that costs a lot of money. What they, all that uh, is funny. The, the advanced reading group has been going on for quite a few years, and I remember telling Terry McDonald, who's a famous editor in New York, about it, and he says, isn't that what we were in in the second grade? <laughs> the advanced reading group. But that, you know, Microsoft has been working on readability, legibility for 20 years now. They've published a lot of stuff. They've funded a lot of research. We've got to do some of that here. I mean, A-Type I could be a, an umbrella for some of, those, some of that research. But I think we, we all want it. We, so I think that together we could pay for some market research. And also to figure out not just what the business is, but what is the end market. The, both the creative professionals, as Monotype calls it, uh, and, and the end users, the, 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 billion, the six billion people who can read. Because they all are getting phones. And it's funny, when I went to Myanmar a few years ago, and I'm hoping to go next month again. Um, there is... People were saying, why are you going to Myanmar? They don't have any, want, want any fonts. And they were just introducing smartphones in, in, in Myanmar. And in, since in the last two years, they've sold nearly 30 million smartphones. There's only 55 million people there, which is, I guess, the size of Italy. It's not, it's not no one. Uh, so they're selling 10, 15 million smartphones a year. Guess what they need? It's, Legible fonts. There's, uh, they, have a, they have a problem like many of the index scripts and the Bromix, the Bromix scripts in general in legibility at small sizes. Uh, the fonts aren't that great. So what's that market? We need, to, we need to figure out not only what our business is, 
in terms of data, but also what, is our, what are our markets? And I divide the markets into these three categories, top, pro, and mass. So top is the business that Pompier has been in all along, custom, enterprise. We work for big companies. We, we can try to convince them that if they do a really great font, either an adaptation, uh, a revival, digi digitization, or totally original font, uh, that if it's really great, it will be copied within weeks. And there will be something, you know, how many clones of Gotham are out there? Uh, there will be something that somebody will be selling very quick. So don't worry about an exclusive license. Plus, our exclusive license price is really high. So they think, oh, if that's the case, it doesn't do us any good to have an exclusive license. Exactly. And after, uh, we, we, will give, we will grant them a year or two of exclusivity, which, of course, at the Font Bureau's if, level of efficiency, even with all these tools, is essentially a de facto. <laughs> you know, we can't get the, the font to retail any faster than that. So they get the exclusivity. And as David Berlow said from the beginning, this is great. We, it, we're, instead of making fonts that we think somebody wants, we're making a font that one person wants for sure and is willing to pay for it. And it turns out that makes a, a pretty good library over time. Now we do you know, what uh, Cyrus Highsmith has been doing is sort of the flip of that. He's doing his own fonts, and then we, we try to hook him up with custom customers, like, like Ford. Um, and uh, I remember we did his pretty well unknown typeface, Amira, for a magazine called Natural Health. Uh, he had already drawn it. It was just a natural match. And I think many of the designers work that way. But it's really hard to, you know, what are you going to do? Throw your, your font into my fonts? I mean, uh, it's, it's so much better if you could at least get the, the investment paid back quickly uh, with, it, with, with the top end sale. So that's what, 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 we, what we live on. Uh, but then the, the biggest market, and, and a market that supports that top, is the, the, the professional designers, the graphic designers on the web or uh, in digital or in, or in print on the desktop, making signs, whatever they're doing. Uh, they, they are buying fonts individually that then are later licensed to their clients um, or, uh, or they're just using it for their book or whatever project they, they, are, they have. That's the big mass and that's pretty much what most of us have identified as their, as their business. The people we, we know, mo a lot of people from that group. Uh, so we do some of that work ourselves, like me. Um, but, it, but then, there's a third group, and we don't think about them. Uh, and, it's, and it's partly because it's only now coming in sight. In the old days, those were the readers, the end users, the people who got the magazine or the advertisement. And now, these people are getting the fonts in their own hands. And there becomes a really interesting question is, can we make it a business in that market? It, how, do we, how do we make money out of those people? Or how do we support our work? How do we get those, our fonts in their hands? How do we let them know that, that, they ha that they're there or that they might want them? How do we get them to understand more about fonts? You know, when, when, uh, type, uh, when Font Bureau started, you, know, there, you all have this same experience. None of your family or friends had any idea what you're talking about. Um, you do what? You what? It's like the print, and uh, and I think it's since Apple and, and Microsoft put a, a font menu in the in the apps, um, people at least have you know we we found it at, at I think it was uh, Type 90, we did a survey of uh, who are um, what's your favorite font of of, of end consumers. And they all had one. Many of them said Arial brightly. Maybe that was, a, maybe that was later. But uh, yeah, maybe it was 95. But the, the, th the thought was that people had these knew something about fonts. And they, they did. I think this is going to increase exponentially. I don't know how fonts are going to get into Facebook in a user-determined way, but they will, in the same way that stickers and emoji are, have gotten in there. Uh, and I think that people, you know, We've been waiting for 25 years to get fonts in email in a reliable way. And 
what the, the, the mechanism that, that is needed for that, on one level, is a kind of universal server network, which we're not, you know, each of the big companies have their own, but it's not yet completely opened up. It will. There will be, uh, there will be f uh, several big groups of people, Microsoft, Apple, and Google, and probably Amazon, who are serving fonts around the world uh, that you can figure out how to get into people's hands. Now, that may not be an individual sale to an, an end user. It may be uh, a, a library that you sell uh, or you license on an annual basis uh, to, to one of the big guys. But I think that's going to happen. I think that, uh, that, and that's the hardest thing for us to understand. What is that business? How do we address it? And how do we market in that? that, in, for, in that we're talking about the entire planet here. So suddenly, what was a very arcane, very small, you know, non-industry, uh, just to put it in perspective, uh, I think I gl glanced over the slide about what's the, the total number, um, and people had said the high number was 1.5 billion. Uh, several people said one billion is the gross annual revenue of the type business, including everything, including what the money they spend at Apple. Uh, that's, that's a nice number. Other people said, is, I don't believe monotype. I think the total is maybe 150 million. You know, uh, I don't know. I, I, uh, one, one company that should know said uh, internally six, 650 million. It's something, I think it's something between, in that area between 600 and a billion. But just to put that in perspective, Microsoft is what? 659, 60 billion a year in the software business. The whole software business is 420, 440, um, depending on who you talk to. Gartner. Uh, okay, so it's a quarter of a percent of the whole industry if it's a billion. So it's not big business. It's not that would hardly be regarded today as a big, big industry. You know, it's not a sector or anything. There's, uh, no, and no one knows what it is. But if you then find a way for us to connect to the readers directly, the end customers, something big is going to happen. And one of the things that's going to do to us is completely kick us in the head about pricing. So what do we have to do to get ready? Um, there, we have to figure out with Google, Amazon, Apple, Adobe, whoever, how the cloud distribution is going to work uh, more than what we've got now. Because now it's just directed at the, at the top end. Um, then we have to figure out our licensing. And I, how many times has the most boring speaker at a type I every year said, we're going to have to reform licensing? And then they show models of what that could be. And everybody falls back to sleep. <laughs> You know, as somebody said at this conference, nobody reads these, <laughs> these licensing agreements anyways. So, um, but we got to figure it out. And the best suggestion that's come up in, that I've heard is the Creative Commons licensing, like, um, like they use at YouTube. So that um, there are some free, there's a lot of free, but if, if there are rights that are being protected and you want to use a font in your not a font, but a uh, video, a mute piece of music in your YouTube video. Um, they have a way of looking it up and sending you a nice note saying, these people have signed up, and I can't remember what YouTube calls it, in, in our Creative Commons arrangement. And here's a, if you send us, if you pay $15, you can use that video. Or whatever, they price it out and give it to you. It's all done automatically. We're going to have to figure that out. So uh, that's really important. And the price has to be something that people will pay. So my final uh, comment on that is, what is that price? And I, I was uh, about tarred and feathered 10 years ago in LA when I said 99 cents. So I'm, I'm reducing it. <laughs> <laughs> the price is one loony. I think that's the natural price of a, of a single style to an end user uh, if they're using it for their own communication, for their emails, for their, for their text messages uh, on Facebook and Instagram and whatever. Anyway, that's what we think we have to work out. That's going to be the hardest challenge for us because we're, we're talking about swinging this tiny ship into the big channel. We're talking about consumer marketing 
It's a different world. And uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to change our lives. And I wish all of us the best. So thank you for coming today. <laughs> <laughs>